All right, everybody, it's time to talk about oceanography. It's one of my favorite topics of the year, and it's certainly a very interesting part of Earth space science. And uh, as much as space was the great unknown, and, there a lot, and there's so much that we don't know about the universe, uh, the same thing could be said about oceanography. It's actually a very young science. It's uh, less than 200 years old, the, the study of oceanography. And it's one of those things, just like in space, I said that I, I could run a whole class just about astronomy. Uh, surely you can run a whole class about meteorology. And here we go. You can definitely run a whole class just about oceanography. And there is a, a high school class called marine biology that does focus a lot on these things. So if you're interested in this, you can take marine bio and learn more about this. But we're going to do the overview of the oceans of the world and talk about uh, some of the most basic aspects about oceanography. And you see here some beautiful pictures of what, in my opinion, is the most beautiful part of our planet. And it's what makes our planet so unique, too, the fact that it's covered with oceans. Now, uh, these are the oceans of the world. There are five major oceans in the world. We have the Atlantic Ocean, which is in between the two major continental blocks, between the Americas and the uh, African-European blocks. So there you go. You have the Atlantic Ocean right here. Then you have the Indian Ocean in between the Oceania, Asia, and Africa. And then you have the large Pacific Ocean, which is in between Asia and Oceania and the Americas over here. And that's definitely the largest ocean in the world. Now, in the top, you have a small ocean called the Arctic Ocean. And in the bottom, you have the Southern Ocean, uh, also called Antarctic Ocean. So those are the oceans of the world. Make sure you know it. Now, I also like to point out that... There's also something called seas. Ever heard about the seven seas? I'm going to sail the seven seas. Well, there's way more than seven seas. And I'm going to show you some examples of seas. Here we go. You have the Red Sea, right? You have the Arabian Sea. You have the another sea right there. You have this Asiatic Sea right here, there. Sea of Japan right there. You have a North Sea. Uh, the Russian Sea right there. You have the North Sea right here. All right. You have the sorry, the North Sea is right there, but you have another one there. Yeah, another sea right there. Another one right here. Mediterranean Sea right here. Another one there. Another one here. Caribbean Sea right there. Right. So, what are you seeing common in these seas of the world? Seas are chunks of the ocean which are, are isolated or mostly surrounded by land. Look at the Mediterranean Sea. is a perfect example. It's almost completely surrounded by land, which means they have their own currents, their own uh, evaporation rates, their own animal life, their, their own characteristics. So they're like mini oceans within the, the world. And they actually differ a lot from the oceans they belong to. So, the, for example, the Mediterranean is, is attached to the Atlantic Ocean, but it's very different from the Atlantic. The Sea of Japan is attached to the Pacific Ocean, but it has very peculiar characteristics. And it is not actually under the influence of, of Pacific uh, currents. And so you're going to have different setups. The same thing with the Caribbean Sea. It's usually hotter than the Atlantic as a whole. So, and it's not really part of the... Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean current belt. So as you see, the, the seas are chunks of, of the oceans. So that is what we talk about when we talk about seas. So here you see another uh, the representation of this, uh, how the Mediterranean Sea is surrounded by uh, Africa, Asia, and Europe. And it's right in between those continents. And it's almost completely surrounded by ocean. And even the Mediterranean is actually split into other seas because you can see that you have an area there, an area here, another one there. Each one of those areas with their, their peculiar currents. So uh, people actually have historically split the Mediterranean Sea into smaller seas. And you also see another sea right there, the Black Sea, which is also, it has its own currents. And it's connected to the Mediterranean by the Bosphorus Strait. Um, here you see the, the South, South, South China Sea, which is in between the... Um, Indonesia and uh, and the uh, southern peninsula of of the Asiatic countries and China would be right north of that and then look at here the Caribbean Sea you see how it's surrounded almost completely by islands and land on the, on the Americas and look there the North Sea right there uh, the you also have the 
Scandinavian Sea on the right side, and you have the Greenland Sea and the Norwegian Sea, and then you have the, Carib the Can Canadian Sea up there as well. So you see, seas are isolated pieces of the ocean, all right? Now, you also have bays. Now, bays are not quite seas, although there are a lot of seas can form within bays. But bays are either small or large incursions of water into the land. So, for example, you have in the screen here a small bay where you have, uh, you actually have a peninsula stretching from the, 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 the earth into the thing, which creates a bay surrounding that. You see that? And then here you have the San Francisco Bay, you have the Bay of Bengal in China, in India, which uh, houses uh, the Andonian Sea. And then you have the Chesapeake Bay right here in the U.S. And another bay right there as well. So you see that bays are incursions of ocean into the, into the land. And if they're large enough, they can actually form a separate sea. And that's pretty much how we, uh, what we have. Okay, so that's a bay. Now, if a bay is really large, we call it a gulf, like the Gulf of Mexico or the Gulf of California, which actually forms a, it's an extremely large bay, almost to the point that you could call this a, a, its own sea. And yes, you could theoretically call this the Mexican Sea, but although nobody does. And then you see the Gulf of California is also a large, 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 large bay. Now, meanwhile, look here in the Gulf of Mexico, you see smaller little bays. Look, there's one right there, there's one right here, there's one right there. You know, so there's one right here. These are bays. Look, look at Florida. It's all so see Tampa Bay, you know, Fort Myers Bay. You know, there's a bay right there as well. So their bays are usually small, small. But you can have large, large bays in a large scale. Look at the Gulf of California. You can have a smaller sub-bay right there as well. So bays are incursions of water into the land, and which can form their own seas. And if they're really go big, we call them gulfs, okay? Now, the same thing, we have the word peninsula. Now, a peninsula actually helps form a bay. So, for example, you see over here, I see a bay. But it's actually formed because of a large peninsula, which is a stretch of land that's going into the sea. So, just like a bay is an incursion of water into the land, a um, uh, peninsula is an incursion of land into the water. And it's usually connected to the land by something called an isthmus. So, you see here, it's a narrow stretch of land that actually connects the, the peninsula to the to the continent. And so that's why we call it a peninsula. Now, see here again, a narrow stretch of land that connects the peninsula to the, to, to, the, to the continent. A narrow stretch of land that connects the peninsula to the continent. So that's kind of like what it is. And another word for peninsula is cape. So you see uh, Cape of Good Hope, Cape Canaveral. Those are good examples of it. And actually, this one in the um, left right corner is actually the, the uh, Cape of Good Hope. All right, so then we have, uh, here are more examples of peninsulas, all right? Uh, you have a large, large stretch of land and a narrow bridge connecting that, all right? Here's another one right there, an isthmus that's connecting that peninsula to the land. Florida in itself is also a peninsula because it has a small, narrow band of connecting to a large continent. Look at, uh, same thing for, um, for Italy, it's a peninsula. So you see that, and they actually see how they can actually form large bays, I mean, oceans, and things like that. So that's the goal. Now remember that bays are typically small, it's just like capes are small peninsulas. And so you see here on the previous thing, Cape Canaveral uh, and Cape of Good Hope as good examples of of uh, capes, which are small peninsulas. All right, large peninsulas. You see here in this screen. Now, um, let's talk about the history of oceanography. All right, the the first people to try to seafare were the Poly Polynesians. The Polynesians were were uh, uh, Indian. Well, we call them the native native Indians, but basically they stretched from the Americas into Asia, into the islands of the Pacific. So the Polynesian people were the first large seafarers. Now, even before that, historically, you have people uh, trying to conquer the sea in the Mediterranean. Uh, you have Greek battles and Persian battles in the Mediterranean. You have Egyptians trying to make that uh, you. Uh, naval navies on the on the on the Nile. So navies are not as as ancient things, but the first ones to cross continents were definitely the Polynesian people. And then you have the 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 Vikings with Leif Erikson and other things like that, which actually went from Europe to to Greenland and then finally to the Americas and Newfoundland. All right. So these are just examples, but. 
Mediterranean Sea is another example of, of area of the world which was there were great sea exploration uh, even before the, uh, the common era. So even before Christ, you still have the uh, seafarers going there. But the Polynesians were the first one to really uh, become seafarers that conquered a lot of islands on the on the on the Pacific. In fact, by the time the Europeans found those islands in the 1500s and 1600s, Polynesian people had already been living there for hundreds of years. Now, the age of discovery started with the exploration of the West and the need to try to reach India um, through the through the actual East. So they actually had it. They, India was on the East, and they wanted to get there. But they actually, with people like Christ, Christopher Columbus, actually believed that heading West, you could get to East faster because the Earth was was rounded. And so began the large exploration uh, of the world. And you have all those famous explorers like Ponce de Leon, Vasco da Gama, Columbus, Leif Erikson, Americo Vespucci, uh, Ca Cabot, Drake, Cartier, uh, Chaplin, Cortes. Uh, Hudson, Magellan, Coronado, uh, Pedro Alvarez Cabral, Marco Polo, a bunch of explorers that have taken to the seas and advanced the exploration of the seas, navigation, understanding of currents, understanding of how the wind creates waves. And all of this led to the more and more understanding of the oceans. So as people were trying to conquer the Mediterranean Sea, Polynesian people trying to travel around the world, and the great explorers of the Age of Discovery, you have these these uh, more understanding of the oceans because of it. For example, the Charles Darwin expedition on the HMS Beagle, which you see on the right-hand side here of the screen, they actually went around the entire world, and they had to understand something about the ocean and how it works in order to do that. So with the age of discovery and more and more sea exploration through ships powered by wind, the uh, understanding of our oceanography actually increased. And, but it wasn't until the Challenger expedition, the HMS Challenger, that this, this, this ship here you see on the top right side, that for the first time, a group of scientists went out to the oceans with a dedicated mission of understanding the oceans. Over 200 scientists joined the crew of the HMS scientists, uh, Challenger, and this was the first ever ec oceanography expedition, which was launched with the purpose of understanding currents, studying the depth of the oceans, studying, studying, studying how waves are formed, what causes tides, and all those kinds of things which we're going to actually be learning about now. And two of the most prominent early developers which are also involved in the Challenger Expedition are Prince Albert and Matthew Morey, which were, they were mappers of the currents of the oceans and they were trying to understand how these things worked in order to better understand. And we were talking about eight, late 1800s here even way past the age of discovery, way after Charles Darwin went it, and other great uh, explorers explore the oceans, this is when they actually, for the first time, sent a dedicated message. And that, most people did, uh, consider the birth of oceanography as an actual field of science. Because the discoverers, yes, they learn a lot about the oceans. Yes, the commerce of the um, West in, uh, India trading and all of these things, uh, all the they advance, you know, the the seafaring, pirates of the Caribbean, you saw the movies, all of that advanced the understanding of the oceans. But it wasn't until the Challenger Expedition and Prince Albert and Matthew Morey that oceanography was born, which is why Matthew Morey is considered the father of oceanography. Now, after him, uh, for the next hundreds of years and since actually the beginning of ocean seafaring, since the Mediterranean, you remember I told you about great battles between the Greeks and the, the Persians. Polynesian also battled against each other to, for, for, to, to try to get the islands. You also get the great explorers and things like you saw the movies on Pirates of the Caribbean and there's wars, the Spanish, the Spanish versus Portuguese versus um, Dutch versus... Uh, British people, they were all trying to conquer the oceans. And so the ocean has always been an area of great battles, a great battlefield. And that is definitely part of the oceanography studies as well. And, and that actually had helped advance the science of the oceans because it's something like the sonar, which we'll talk about later, was developed because of ocean warfare. And oceans were also big in the 20th century with the discovery of the seafloor spreading and Alfred Wagner. And, but it, it wasn't until the 20th century that the nor modern oceanography took hold with things like ocean drilling and, the, and exploration of the oceans and really understanding of oceanography, which is what we'll talk about on our next video. I'll see you then.